and welcome to Literally Literary. This episode has been recorded at the El Paso Community College's Literary Fiesta following the screening of the film based on Ron Stallworth's memoir, Black Klansman. My name is Vanessa, and this is Literally Literary, which is brought to you by the Mellon Foundation through the Humanities Collaborative at EPCC and UTEP. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jorge Gomez. I teach English right here at the Rio Grande campus down the street of EPCC. Uh, and I'll let my uh, student introduce herself. Hello, my name is Vanessa Zuniga. Um, I am his student fellow for the Mellon Foundation. We're working together to promote literacy here in El Paso. Um, so, um, we want to welcome uh, Mr. Ron Sawworth to this stage. Let's give him a hand. So first, Mr. Sawworth, it's a great honor uh, to have you here and uh, share the stage with you. Um, we um, both, you know, love the book so much. And... Um, uh, we, we just have some questions that we wanted to ask you about both the book and, and the film, uh, if you don't mind. Um, Vanessa was going to lead things off uh, talking more about the book. And for those of you who don't know, so the book is available out there. And um, Ron has graciously offered to sign copies for you all. Um, there's plenty of copies available out there. So there will be time for you all to purchase one after the Q&A. Um, and as an English professor, uh, so many things we get from the book that we just don't get from the film. And the film, of course, adds some other sub subplots. Um, so Vanessa wanted to ask you about the book itself. Um, go ahead. Okay, so my first question is coming to you as a writer myself. So I just kind of wanted to know a little bit more about what your writing process was like for this book. Well. First of all, when I sign books, my wife signs with me because she was an integral part of this, uh, this project when it started it. So she always signs her dedication page, and I signed uh, as well. So I just want you all to be aware of that. What is my writing process? I really don't have one. <laughs> I sat down with this to start this book in uh, March of 2013, and I started at the beginning chronologically. I was a police officer for 32 years, and that's how we started our. That's how we wrote our reports. You start at the beginning, you bring it to the end, and uh, that's what I did. I wrote. I wrote between the hours of. Uh, roughly uh, 10 o'clock to sometimes 4 a.m. Those are quiet times, or those were quiet times in my life back then. And uh, I had no distractions other than my own making. When I say that, I like to write with a TV on. I don't like writing in solitude. I do fuck on occasion, but basically I like to have noise around me. Um, so I have TV on, watching TV, and start writing. I wrote, I tried to write at least five pages a day. Sometimes I wrote an entire chapter. But I tried to write as often as I could, because once you get into the groove, it just starts to flow. And uh, this book took me nine months to write, from March of uh, 2013, nine months later, I put the pen down. Thank you. Um, well, I, I can say as someone who teaches writing and Vanessa herself is studying English at UTEP, uh, it, it's a very, um, it's, it's very well written and I really like the procedural aspect that we don't get as much in the film. So that there's that element that I really found interesting that kind of behind the scenes look at you know, how does this kind of investigation goes about? And of course, a lot of your thought process, especially in that crescendo scene of the, the Polaroid, uh, which of course in, in the book, you know, you talk very eloquently about, and it's a, it's a great, another great um, reason 
to get the book because you don't you don't get that in the film your your thoughts about it. Um, the, the film itself, of course, doesn't chronicle your time here. And so Vanessa had a, a question for you about that, okay? So my next question was actually, which scene from the film adaptation you enjoyed seeing reenacted the most? The dance scene. <laughs> that reminded me of my uh, days in high school here when I would go to house parties and uh, we would be cutting it up on the dance floor. <laughs> Uh, it brought back memories of that the first time uh, my wife and I saw that uh, that movie uh, with my going to house parties here in El Paso. By the way, that first girl that comes out when uh, they start the scene, that's uh, Spike Lee's daughter. That's Spike Lee's daughter that you see come out. And so kind of going off that, how did you feel, you know, so... Uh, how many, for how many of was it the first time watching this film? And it, it's a very powerful film, right? It, especially because of the, the connection to the modern day at the end, which, of course, you also uh, discuss in, in your afterward. Um, and in, in, in terms of the, of the differences, um, well, not really the differences, but the investigation itself. Um, Vanessa had a question about it for you because we get that scene where, you know, your police chief orders you to destroy the evidence. Um, and in the book, you know, you share your thoughts on that. You share your thoughts on um, the, the, the Polaroid photo as well, which is very, to us, you know, something that we talk about a lot. Um, but Vanessa, what was your question about the investigation? I just wanted to know if you had continued the investigation, what do you think the outcome might have been? When I was ordered to, uh, <clears throat> first of all, let me back up a little bit. This investigation ended because you saw the phone call with John David Washington as me with Walter Breachway, the Klan chapter president, where the president told him uh, he was going to, uh, he wanted him to take over control of the chapter. That's the reason this investigation came to an end. They were insistent on Ron Stallworth becoming the chapter president of the Colorado Springs Ku Klux Klan. Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when I went to my chief and told the chief what they wanted, the chief said, stop the investigation now. No more contact with him, no more answering the phones, nothing. He said, I want Ron Stallworth Klansman to disappear. I argued with the chief. I said, chief, we are in a unique position right now to further this investigation, to go higher up the food chain of the white supremacist movement in the state of Colorado. What we had accomplished up to that point had never been done before in that state. And now they wanted me to be their president. I argued that with close consultation with the uh, district attorney's office, we could do this and stay out of uh, legal, legal trouble. And at, at any rate, I said, what do we got to lose? We can always shut it down at any time. The chief was adamant. He said, in the investigation now, and destroy the evidence. He didn't want anyone in Colorado Springs to know that we had cops undercover in the KKK, even though everything we did was constitutionally, uh, by constitutional guidelines, everything we did was sanctioned by the chief of police himself. We did nothing illegal. So I argued against that. You argue with the chief at your own risk. I argued as far as I could, ultimately went back to my office tore up a report here, a report there when my sergeant wasn't looking. I took the two notebooks about that thick with reports, took them to my car, drove home, and from those police reports is where this book came from. And um, kind of going off that, the, the film diverges, you know, and as, as a kind of a budding amateur screenwriter myself, I know that there's that artistic license to kind of bring out things that Spike Lee 
might have wanted to flesh out more, like the romantic subplot and also um, the, uh, the, 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 the wife, uh, and in general, kind of going more into the role that women play in the white supremacist movement. Um, so just two examples, but Vanessa had a question about that, you know, some of those differences. I just wanted to know if you felt that the changes that were made in the film took away from your truth of the story or if they furthered your message that you were trying to put out. No, 80% um, of my book is in this movie, 80%. When you sign the rights to a story to Hollywood, they're gonna play with it. They're gonna play with it and you got no control over it. So first of all, there was no love scene there was no love story, I should say, with Patrice. Patrice does not exist. She never did exist. That's, that's a Hollywood script writing, okay? So that whole Patrice, Ron Stallworth thing was creative writing. Um, the bombing at the end did not happen. They talked to me on the phone about bombing the two gay bars that we had in Colorado Springs. They talked a lot about bombing those two bars, but they never carried it out. In fact, the FBI got it very interested when the subject of bombing those bars came up. So that last scene that you saw with the uh, bombing of the, the cars, that was alluding to my phone conversations with him about bombing the gay bar. That was creative writing too. There are several other instances of creative writing uh, that exist in the, in the uh, movie versus the book. But that just gives you a couple of examples. And, and, and I should say it's an Oscar winner for you know, best adapted screenplay. And it really goes to show the, the, the power that Spike Lee has to draw from your story, right? And your story itself, even without, of course, all of that is powerful enough as in your memoir. Uh, let, me, let me add something to that. Yeah. Spike took a script that had already been written by Charlie Wachtel and David Rabinowitz, um, quote, unquote, two Jewish boys, as David Duke called them. Uh, they approached me and my wife and uh, basically said they wanted to write a screenplay to, to Black Klansman. I asked them, what have you guys done? They said nothing. Okay. So I then told them, go ahead and write your screenplay, but I have complete control over it in terms of what can be done with it. And if you agree to that, we got a deal. So they signed a contract to that effect. They wrote the initial screenplay. And um, in the screenplay, there was no Patrice. The one they wrote, there was no Patrice. There was no bombing at the end. And there were a few other things in it that you saw that was not in the original screenplay that they wrote. When Spike Lee came on board, <laughs> Spike read it. He said, this is too white. <laughs> he said, we need to, we need to add some more uh, black to it. So Spike and his writing partner, a professor from the University of Kansas, who's also a, a screenwriter, they polished it up. They made it more conducive to me as a black man. And uh, that's the screenplay of which this movie was based and which won the Academy Award. But those two Jewish boys are now Academy Award winners the very first time out. You know, So that shows you, if you all have a dream, you all believe in something, uh, follow through with it. These guys had the audacity to contact me about writing a screenplay when they had never written one before. They took a chance, and we gave them the opportunity. They ran with it, and everybody came out ahead. Follow your dream. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing that insight. I wasn't aware of that backstory. Um, uh, one, one last question before we open up to uh, a couple audience questions. Uh, this one is a little personal to me, and I think all of us here in this and who are present here today. Um, on August 3rd, as, as we all know, you know, we uh, were the victims of a white supremacist attack at the Walmart. And um, you, uh, and of course in the film, 
um, you know, are um, quite clear and, and you know, admonishing uh, our current president's, you know, connections and, and views, white supremacist views. Um, and you all yourself have been active in, you know, the Opaso Strong movement with the rallies and, and things like that. Um, so did you have any, any thoughts on, you know, what you chronicle here occurred 50, 60 years ago? Um, but unfortunately, it seems like they say re that history repeats itself. Um, did you have any thoughts on, you know, for those of us who are still kind of processing that trauma, even if we ourselves were not there, you know, the fact that in this case, uh, the Latinx community was targeted and the idea that El Paso as the safest city was targeted as well. I, I, we just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, 41 years ago when I was having these phone conversations with David Duke, he and his clans people specifically mentioned El Paso. They said that their, their, David Duke's immigration policy was to set up Klansmen along the border here and the border in San Diego along Tijuana and to arm his Klansmen with 30-30 and 30-odd sco uh, scoped rifles, hunting rifles. And they were going to come down here with those rifles along the Rio Grande and shoot, and I quote, any wetback they caught crossing into the United States. That was his immigration policy 41 years ago, okay? Today we have an, uh, an imbecilic moron sitting in Barack Obama's seat who wants to build a wall, okay? And he has even gone so far as to uh, basically say, uh, tell his ICE people that it's okay to shoot Mexican citizens on the other side of the border. Did you notice that American flag at the end of this movie? It morphed from red, white, and blue to white and black. Did you also notice that it was upside down? Do you know what that means? It's a sign of distress. That was put in there by Spike for a reason. He was saying we are a nation under distress, in distress. And anyone who can't see that, I don't, I don't know what's, what, what's wrong with you. Because we see it every day. What I was dealing with 41 years ago with David Duke, Donald Trump used that playbook in 2016 to run for president, and the American public put him in office. Shame on him. Shame on him. We're in a constitutional crisis right now because of that moron. And people, the Republican Party sits back and allows us to go on. And we're, we're at their mercy right now because of the numbers. So what I heard from Trump's campaign did not alarm me because I had heard it 41 years earlier. It's coming from David Duke. That should alarm all of you. We are a nation in distress. Thank you again, Mr. Stallworth. And I will say that you do discuss that in, in, in your memoir, um, the, you know, David Duke's uh, plans to come right here to El, El Paso and to us, you know, both of us native to the region, it just really struck a chord and, you know, something that, um, uh, again, just kind of brought back those flashbacks of, of August 3rd, I think a day that none of us here will ever forget. Uh, if you don't mind, we did. Oh, okay. So Vanessa Sorry, had one more I had question. One more question. <laughs> and relating back to El Paso, I wanted to know what brought you back because you, you grew up here, but you moved around the country. So I wanted to know what brought you back to El Paso. I left El Paso in '72 to Colorado Springs, started my career. Forty-four years later, 2016, I returned. 
to marry that woman right there. I am the proud, very proud husband of a Mexican bride. And we are three years into our honeymoon. Her role in this book, she was sitting here in, her, in El Paso at her home. I was in uh, Utah writing. We were on the phone to each other, sometimes eight hours, six, seven, eight hours a day, sometimes three times during the day we'd call one another. And I told her what I was working on. She said she'd like to see it. So I emailed her what I would write during the day whatever writing I did, whatever page, chapter, whatever. And Patsy is very good with punctuation and things like that. Me, I could care less. Let the editor fix it. <laughs> I would email the, my writings to Patsy. Patsy would uh, send me back her comments and tell me, you should correct this, you should rephrase that. Most of what she told me, I incorporated. So she, in essence, was my first editor. Her eyes were the first ones to see the manuscript as I was creating it. When I finished the manuscript, she was the first one that read the completed manuscript. So when we do book signings, I honor my bride of for three years. I honor her by telling her to sign her dedication page. And you all should feel honored to have her signature along with mine, because it gives me pride to know that she played a part in this. And I'm very, very happy. Thank you again. Um, we do want to open it up to questions. So we have a mic set up here. If you all, anyone wants to come up and ask uh, Mr. Solver her question, we have time for maybe two or three. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And that movie revived it uh, mm -hmm. significantly. Uh, is that an example of the power of cinema over public opinion and perception? Yes. Spike Lee has a unique history to uh, Birth of a Nation. He did, uh, when he was in film school at New York University, he did his, um, I don't know if it was senior thesis or what, but he did his project on Birth of a Nation. And he wrote a screenplay while in college that was filmed for his college project that was a response to Birth of a Nation. And he got slammed by his professors. So Spike has that scene in there for a reason. Because this, this film, is, in its own way, is an answer to Birth of a Nation. You know, I used to sit in the car in surveillance while my white avatar was in meetings with these guys. I used to sit in my car listening to his body uh, wire, listening to Birth of a Nation over the wire. Okay, I have sat and tried to watch that movie from front to back on YouTube. It is boring, it is stupid, it is lies, and it's nothing but a homage to white supremacy. But in its day, 1915 or thereabouts, in its day, it was considered the equivalent of Star Wars today. It was a mega blockbuster in those days. And it established modern day cinema, according to people, movie critics and so forth. They still point to that movie with some of the camera work that he did back then and other other uh, things that were done, stunt work. Uh, Birth of a Nation is given a lot of credit for the creation of modern day uh, cinema. And it was a blockbuster for its time. So you can't sleep on that movie and the Klan to this day still uses it for recruitment purposes at their meetings. They generally would close their meetings by showing the movie. Uh, I challenge any of you to go get on YouTube and watch it yourself if you can. Okay. Thank you, sir. 
One more question. Um, so, ma'am? Go ahead. no reason. I just, like I said, I came home one day, I sat down, put pen to paper, and it began. Um, I had always thought about one day writing a book. On this particular day, I felt motivated to finally get started. And um, the rest, they say, is history. Take to the ending of the movie? Um, well, throughout the movie, and, and there was a Yeah. Um, a little backstory to that. The original ending of this movie was the cross burning in the end. That was going to be the end of the movie. And then Charlottesville happened. And then Donald Trump opened his mouth and made that dumb comment about there were very good people on both sides. Ladies and gentlemen. There are no good Nazis in America, in the world. A Nazi is not good, a good person. But that moron in the White House said there were very good people on, on both sides, and he also said not all of them were neo-Nazis. Well, you saw the film. You saw the Confederate flag with these idiots and the swastikas and everything else. That's when Spike Lee said... And when Heather Heyer died, that's when Spike Lee said, the ending is going to change. And he incorporated that footage with the permission of Heather Heyer's mother. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but when you saw that car run into the crowd, there was a woman in, wearing a green blouse or whatever lying on the hood of the car. That's Heather Heyer. She's dead. You saw a murder. And her mother wanted that scene in this movie. So that's how that came about. You're welcome. Thank you, ma'am, for your question. We have a question over here. Um, I have like two questions, ma'am. Go ahead. Right. Uh, first one, I understand that um, now, but especially back then, there was a lot of hatred for police in the African American community. So I was wondering if you had any. Police officer, but not but not just that, like just being a police officer in general. I'm sure that's probably a tough thing to do. I was not the first black police officer in Colorado Springs. I was the first black detective. Yeah. Uh, and the reason I became a detective in the narcotics division, which by the way, that's another falsity in the movie. I went from narcotics a year later. I went to, or two years later, I went into intelligence, not the reverse of what the movie depicted. But the reason I uh, was uh, put into the narcotics division was because there was drugs running rampant in the black community of Colorado Springs. Back then, it was heroin, uh, heroin and ma marijuana. And none of the white narcs could penetrate that community because you knock, they'd knock on the door and the, the people inside would see a white face and basically wouldn't deal with them. So they came to me. They knew I wanted to work uh, undercover. They came to me and asked me if I wanted to do this. I said yes. Was there any conflict? Black people were putting heroin on the streets to selling it to other blacks and everyone else, by the way. But they were putting heroin on the streets that was impacting the black community. I had no problems arresting people from my community, from my race, and if you'll excuse my language, throwing their asses in jail. Because they were doing what they could to make money and in the process destroy that community. 
You still see that today with crack and other such drugs. So no, there was no conflict for me whatsoever. Uh, if you're dealing drugs, you're doing anything to destroy the community, you need to be dealt with. And if the only way that, can, you, that you can deal with that problem is to get someone from within the community to go and affect it, I'm all for it. The hatred that they had then towards uh, uh, black officers, uh, I got more hatred, if you will, from members of the black community than I did from the white community. I got called the nigger on many occasions. I got called a sellout. I got called a traitor to my race simply because I chose to be a police officer and enforce the law. And I wore all of those labels with pride because I knew what I was, I knew who I was, and I knew what I was doing was effective and necessary. So um, you still have that going on today with the uh, police and then the black community. Uh, some things never change. And um, I'm also quite wondering, for the movie, you showed Uh, kind of, sort of. <laughs> After David Duke came to Colorado Springs, and I was assigned to be his bodyguard, he left. I waited about a day or two, and figured, what the heck, picked up the phone and called him up down in Louisiana. And I said, Mr. Duke, how did you like your stay in Colorado Springs? You know, I loved it. I said, did you have a good time? He said, oh, yeah. He said, very nice, very nice city, nice people and whatnot. I said, I wish we had had a chance to spend more time together because I really wanted to soak up your wisdom. He liked to be fond over, kind of like that idiot in the White House does. So I finally, I said, did anything unusual happen while you were in town? <laughs> he said, well... I had an encounter with this nigger cop. I said, really? <laughs> what happened? And then he proceeded to tell me everything that happened where I, where, where a picture was taken and I threatened to throw him in prison and uh, uh, the conflict, confrontation we had and whatnot. He told me that as if I wasn't there. And all the time he's telling me that I'm saying, he did what to you? He said, what to you? How dare he? I said, that's the problem with those people. You give them an inch, they'll take a mile. We need to do something about that. And I went on and on, and he was agreeing with me. Finally, after I had had fun uh, messing with him, and my sergeant had fallen out of his chair two or three times laughing, finally I hung up and uh, wrote a report about it. So, yes, that scene happened to a certain extent, but not like depicted there. If anything, it was a lot funnier in real life than what you saw. And um, so that photograph, you, you did take that photograph. That photograph, that scene did happen. I don't have the photograph now. I've lost it. Otherwise, it would have been in my book. Spike Lee was ready to kill me because I didn't have it. But yeah, that, that did happen. That did happen. I didn't plan it. I did take the Polaroid with me, uh, the Polaroid camera with me to take a picture with David Duke, because again, I told him nobody would believe me. So that part was true. But re what really set up that scene was, initially I put my arm on both David's shoulder and the other guy's shoulder who was the state grand dragon or state leader. The state grand dragon thought it was funny. David Duke pushed my arm away and said, I'm sorry, but I can't be seen in a photo with you like that. That pissed me off. And that's when I decided, OK. So I gave the camera to my white avatar. And I went back, and I stood between David Duke and the Colorado Grand Dragon with my hands down to my waist. And I said, one, two, three. <laughs> and that's when he snapped the picture. And that's when that scene unfolded, like you said. That was a lot, a uh, little backstory to this. When they were filming that scene, 
John David called me up the day before they filmed that scene. They were setting it up for the next day's shoot. And John David said, we had just done this, he said, and we're getting ready to film this scene tomorrow. And he said, I'm nervous as heck. He said, I was scared. He said, I know we're acting. I know this isn't real. I know these Klan guys are not Klan guys, they're actors. But I'm in the room with these people, he said, and it's terrifying. He said, how did you, how were you able to do this in real life? He says, because I'm, I'm acting and I'm terrified about what's going on. And I laughed. I said, if you're terrified by it, then the movie's coming along pretty good. And I said, what you need to do is tomorrow when you do the actual filming, go in there with an attitude that this is your house. You own it. I mean, you're the cop. You're the one with the badge. They're in your city, your territory. Go in there with the idea that you own it and you project that because that's what I did on, uh, on that occasion when I caught, uh, confronted David Duke. No Klan guy was going to come in Colorado Springs and tell me that I can't do this, that you, you should do that, or order me around. Uh, that wasn't going to happen. So that's how that came about. That's a good scene, too. It's a favorite scene. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, until the next scene. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And that, the, you know, the power of the Polaroid is, as you mentioned, is such a powerful moment in, in the film as it is in the book. It's a, a subversive act, and there's so many layers of dramatic irony in it. Um, and again, I just want to stress that in, in, in the book itself, you know, you do get all those details. And I think even if, if as you mentioned, the, the photo is, is lost, it is now, you know, in some sense preserved or replicated in the in the big in the big screen. Um, so we want to make sure we have enough time for you to uh, sign some books. Uh, but if you all could just uh, give Mr. Sauer a hand. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us in our discussion on Black Klansmen with Ron Stallworth himself. If you haven't read it, I hope we inspire you to pick up a copy. 